It gives me a great honor and a privilege to introduce Nathan and Elisa Lewin, um, who are going to tell us the most remarkable true story about um, the Sugihara visas. Uh, my parents uh, were Dr. Isaac Lewin, who was well known in the United States, but before the war also well known in Poland because he was the son of the rabbi of Jeshuv, who was uh, not only a great Talmudic and biblical scholar, but also elected twice to the Polish Sejm. Um, my parents married as a result of an arranged marriage, a shidduch, uh, which was originally suggested by the rabbi who was the originator of the idea of Dafyomi, who was a good friend of my grandfather's. Uh, Rav Meir Shapiro, uh, the founder of Yeshiva Chachmei Lublin, was a friend of my grandfather's, who was Rabbi Aaron Levine, or Levin, as it was known in Poland. Uh, and um, my mother had been raised in Amsterdam. Her father was a very successful businessman in Amsterdam, and when he was approached for a contribution to Yeshiva Chachmei Lublin by Rabbi Meir Shapiro, who visited Amsterdam in the 1930s, um, he asked Rabbi Shapiro whether he could suggest that his daughter, who was raised in Amsterdam, be uh, uh, become the wife of my father who was uh, born in the town of Bielitschka in Poland, had gotten a degree in law from the University of Lvov, wrote in Polish and German and Hebrew, was a young scholar, well known and also became well known in Poland. The suggestion for this marriage, for the shidduch, worked out, although unfortunately Rabbi Meir Shapiro passed away at a very young age before my parents got married. And my grandfather, my mother's father, ensconced them, both my parents, in the city of Lodz, L-O-D-Z, which was basically the second largest city in Poland, a very large Jewish population. And shortly after they settled in Lodz, the pop, the, in an election in which the Jews played a big role in Lodz, my father was elected to the city council of Lodz, uh, where he defended Jewish rights. Uh, he's written, a, he wrote about that, uh, including some colloquies with great anti-Semites in Lodz. But in any event, my mother and my father lived in Lodz, and I was born there in 1936, in January of 1936. Um, there was a lot of publicity about the fact that Hitler was, of course, marching to different places in Europe, and there was some substantial threat that he would go into Poland. It was not unexpected. My mother, who was very worldly and well-educated, uh, kept up with the news and was concerned that Hitler might come into Poland, and certainly she had read about what he had done with regard to the Jews, and she got my father to agree that even though he was on the city council, and not just on the city council, but in fact on the emergency committee that had been set up, as I understood it, by the city council in case of Hitler's invasion, she got him to agree that if Hitler did march into Poland, we would immediately leave and try to get out of Poland and go across the border into disputed territory, which Lithuania claimed on the other side of the border, but you could only get across by difficult legal means or by smuggling across the border. So my father agreed to that, although he had every intention of returning to Lodz if he got us across the border. 
at that time, at the beginning of September of 1939, my mother's parents and my mother's younger brother, whose name was Leo or Levy, were with my parents in Lodge. They were visiting. And when Hitler did march across, and the decision was made by my parents that they would immediately try to leave Poland and go east across the border into Lithuania. My mother's father, who had substantial assets in Amsterdam, and particularly diamonds, was loath to just leave that and go across the border into Lithuania. So I was told that he went up to Warsaw from Ludge and flew from Warsaw to Amsterdam in order to collect his diamonds and other things and then go from there, hopefully, ultimately, to join us where we were going. Um, just as an aside, bottom line, he did go to Amsterdam. Relatives of mine told me that they witnessed how diamonds were being sewn into the lining of his coat because he was going to go on a train that would stop at the Swiss border. And apparently the Jews in Amsterdam knew that that train, if you stopped at a particular stop, smugglers could take you across the border into Switzerland. Bottom line was he did not get off at the right stop. Either he slept through it or he mistakenly got off at another stop and he was turned over by the Swiss guards to the Germans and ended up in Auschwitz where he perished. Um, but my parents, I, my grandmother, my mother's mother and my mother's brother did smuggle across the border into Lithuania. I was, although I have no personal recollection, I did hear the story of how I was carried through the forest in the middle of the night, told that if I made any noise at all, I was three years old, if I made any noise at all, the wolves would come out of the forest and eat me. So I was smart enough to keep quiet, and we apparently made our way through the forest and made it to Vilna. We were not the only Jews who were fleeing Poland. There were others who, with foresight that my mother had, um, did make it to Vilna. My father had intended to go back to Lodz, but the Germans were so efficient in destroying the Polish rail system that my father never could make it back to Lodz, and that's what saved his life. Um, but we ended up in Vilna. My mother was not happy about being in Vilna because she felt at the time correctly that Vilna itself was vulnerable to Hitler's army and that ultimately there was a danger in being there. She had been a Dutch citizen, but by marrying my father, she lost her Dutch citizenship because in those days, it was taken for granted as a matter of international law or generally that a wife had the citizenship of her husband. And consequently, when she married my father, she became a Polish citizen. I, of course, being po born in Poland, was a Polish citizen as well. So the three of us were Polish citizens. My grandmother, who was with us, was a Dutch citizen, and my uncle, my mother's brother was also a Dutch citizen. My mother, when they arrived in Vilna, looked for some place to go to. Now, obviously, this was this period between September of 1939 and into the summer of 1940. And she came up with the idea that the safe place to go to was to the Dutch East Indies. At that point, Japan was not really in the war, and she felt that as, a, as Dutch citizens, her mother, her brother, and since she had been a Dutch citizen, maybe we could all go to the Dutch East Indies. So she approached from Vilna, very close to Vilna, and apparently 
short, just a short trip away, was the city of Kaunas, or Kovno, as the Jews called it. So the Dutch consul in Kovno, Kovno did not have an ambassador, Dutch ambassador, but it had the Dutch consul, was a businessman who had been put in there as the honorary Dutch consul in Kovno. His name was Jan Zwartendijk. And she approached Jan Zwartendijk. She approached Jan Zwartendijk and asked Jan Zwartendijk whether, as a former Dutch citizen, she and her husband and her son and her mother and her brother, who were still Dutch citizens, could get a visa to go to the Dutch East Indies. Now, the Dutch citizens didn't need a visa. They had the right to go to the Dutch East Indies, which was a Dutch colony. But since she was then a Polish citizen, and my father was a Polish citizen, and I was a Polish citizen, we would need visas to go there. By that time, because of the war, the Dutch had apparently decided they were issuing no visas to foreigners to go to the Dutch East Indies. And Jan Zwartendijk got that instruction and communicated it to my mother. My mother did not simply take his word as the last possible word, and she then wrote to the Dutch ambassador in Riga, a man by the name of De Decker, and asked him whether, as a former Dutch citizen, she and her mother, her brother, her husband, and her son could get visas to go to the Dutch East Indies. He replied, no, you cannot. But, he said, you, can, you don't need a visa to go to the Dutch West Indies, which are off of South America, to Suriname and Curaçao. And he advised her that, in, I think in a letter, and she then sent him her Polish passport. Now, Poland was no longer in existence at that time. Polish passport was worthless, but she had a Polish passport, and she sent him her Polish passport and asked him to please write in the Polish passport that no visa was needed to Suriname or Curaçao, and he had told her the reason was that if you go to Suriname or Curaçao, anybody, whether you're a Dutch citizen or anybody else, the governor, when you arrive, could allow you in to Suriname or Curaçao. And my mother said, in the request she made to the Decker, you don't have to mention anything about the governor giving you permission, because I may not go, I'm not inter really interested in going to Suriname or Curaçao. So, De Decker actually wrote that into her Polish passport. There's a picture of a Polish passport that my father put into a book that he, in which he wrote the story, a photograph of my mother's Polish passport with De Decker's endorsement in French. She took that Polish passport and went back to Jan Zwartendijk and asked him at that point to please write what the Decker had written into the Polish passport to please write that on the one travel document we had, which was a Lydimas, a Latvian travel document, it was a big sheet, I, I still have that document at home, and asked him to write that on there. And he did. You want to go on with the story? Sure. So, just to give some dates, when my grandmother, my grandmother had written to the Dutch ambassador, to De Decker in Riga, and had asked him if he would please write this notation in her Polish passport and leave out the last section. In other words, just write that you don't need a visa to go to Curaçao or Suriname, and don't say anything about needing the permission of the governor of Curaçao. He agreed to do that. And we have a copy of her passport, which has his handwritten notation in French, and it's dated July 11th, 1940. That was sent back to her in the mail, so it took several days. And then when she received it, she went back to the Dutch consul, who was closer to her home, 
to Jans Wartendijk, and she asked him if he would copy what essentially his, his boss, the ambassador, had now written into her Polish passport, whether he would copy that onto the Leitemas. The Leitemas was a travel document that was for my grandfather, my grandmother, and my father. And we have that original document. And we have on that document, Jan Zwartendijk agreed to do that, and he copied word for word and hand wrote the notation that says that you do not need a visa to go to Curaçao or Suriname, and his notation is dated July 22nd, 1940. So the, the Decker one is July 11th, July 22nd is the Zwartendijk one. Then on the basis of that, my grandmother took the Leidemas and she went to Sugihara. Who suggested to her that she go? My recollection is that at some point my mother had told me that Jan Zwartendijk had suggested that she go see Sugihara to get a transit a visa th to Japan on the theory that they were going to be going to Suriname or Curaçao. The unfortunate contradiction to that is that Jan Zwartendijk's son, in correspondence that I had with him several years ago, after Jan Zwartendijk had already passed away, wrote to me that to his recollection, his father told him that he did not know Sugiara. So it is somewhat of a mystery as to how my mother got from Zwartendijk to Sugihara to get Sugihara to write the famous Sugihara visa, the first Sugihara visa. But somehow, in those few days, after she had the Zwartendijk notation, she went to Sugihara, who was the Japanese consul in Kaunas, in Kovna, and Sugihara agreed to write, and we have a handwritten Sugihara visa on the same Leitemas. Um, he hand wrote a transit visa through Japan for my, it was my grandfather, my grandmother, and my father who were on the Leitemas. But Sugihara kept a list of all the visas that he issued. So the handwritten visa on the Leitemas is dated July 26, 1940. So July 11th was the Dedecker notation, July 22nd was Wartendijk, and four days later, on July 26th, Sugihara wrote his visa. But he kept this list, and on the list, my great-grandmother, my grandmother's mother, Rachel Sternheim, received the 16th Sugihara visa on this list. She's number 16. Number 17 is Isaac Levine, my grandfather, that's the Leitemas for the three of them, for my grandfather, my grandmother, and my father. And then the 17th, uh, that was the 17th visa, the 18th visa went to Leo Sternheim. Leo Sternheim was my grandmother's brother, Leo or Levy, and he received the 18th Sugihara visa. So all three of these had had this notation written by Zwartendijk, and then were able to receive Sugihara visas. When you look at the list that Sugihara kept of the visas, there are only a handful of visas that are issued the few days before the 26th of July. And on the 26th of July, maybe about 10 or 12, on the 27th of July, the list explodes. And if you see in the memoirs written by Yokiko Sugihara, Sugihara's wife, she recalls that on the morning of July 27th, she looked out, they woke up, and the courtyard in the consulate was mobbed, mobbed with Jews who were looking to get these visas from Sugihara. What I assume happened is that my great uncle, my grandmother's brother, who was learning then in the yeshiva, spoke with his chavruta, who was uh, Nathan Gutworth, and told him, look what we now have. We have, these we have this notation from Jan Zwartendijk, which says you don't need a visa to go to Curaçao, and we were able to get these transit visas through Japan from Sugihara. And word spread like wildfire through the community, through the yeshiva, and that's undoubtedly what led to the crowd of Jews who realized this was a potential way out. And the story then is that Sugihara basically would stay up around the clock every night for about a month 
until the end of August. By the beginning of September, he had left. And he wrote, hand wrote over 2,000 visas, many of which, like the visa that was for my father and his parents, were for multiple people. So he saved well over the 2,000, people say 6,000, maybe more, who, who actually had his, um, his visas. But what started that flow was this original Curacao visa, which was kind of ironic because the notation was a non-visa visa, right? It was saying you don't need a visa, which was a very unusual thing to write because usually if you don't need a visa, you just don't write anything in the passport. The passport or the travel document, you only stamp the visa when you need a visa. And I think people never understood what prompted Jan Zwartendijk to start writing this very odd notation on these travel documents. Why would you start writing you don't need a visa? And the answer is really my grandmother, because my grandmother's the one who had the communication back and forth several times with first Zwartendijk, then with the ambassador in Riga, with De Decker, and she's the one who convinced the ambassador to write you don't need a visa to go to Curaçao on her travel document and ask him to please leave out the portion about requiring the permission of the governor of Curaçao to enter Curaçao. And that's where this legend started. That's where the, the legend that they wrote in the passport started. And you can see that the language, the French, that Ambassador de Decker wrote in her passport was copied word for word by the consul, by Zwartendijk, onto the Leitemas. And that's how it started. Now the list, again, in the list that Aliza talked about, the interesting thing is that on the left-hand column, you have the citizenship of the person who was issued the visa. So next to my father's name, it says Polish, because we were all Polish, my father, my mother, and myself. But next to my grandmother's name, and next to Le Levi Sternheim, it says Dutch, Hollands, Netherlands. Netherlands because they were applying to Sugihara as Dutch citizens, which they were, they were Dutch citizens. They ended up not being able to come to the United States. My father, because he was a distinguished rabbi and there were requests made to the U.S. State Department from Agudath Israel, from Lubavitch, and maybe from other entities to permit him to come to the United States as a non-immigrant, because the United States was not allowing Jews, basically, or you know anybody who was fleeing from the Nazis to enter the United States under the immigration laws. But they did allow select rabbis and important Jews who were fleeing to come in as non-immigrants. So my father and I and my mother came to America as non-immigrants, and then we had to go up to Canada and immigrate from Canada to the United States. That's the legal way that ultimately I came to the United States, was first as a non-immigrant with the Sugihara visa that brought me to Kobe in Japan, and then the permission to take a ship from uh, Japan to San Francisco, and then once we settled in the United States, the procedure was you went up to Canada, you filled out the immigration papers, and then you came into the United States that way, legally. Just, and now I know that there are other um, descriptions of how these Curacao visas came about. And it's interesting, as we mentioned, Nathan Gutworth was my great uncle, Leo or Levi Sturm's Sternheim's Chevuta was his study partner in the yeshiva. Um, Nathan Gutworth, as I say, my, grand, my great grandmother was number 16 on the list, my grandparents and my father were number 17 on the list, and my great uncle Leo Sternheim was 18 on the list. Nathan Gutworth was number 1264 on the list, and he, my family received their visa July 26th. He received his visa August 6th, 1940. And then also an uh, individual who did uh, play a role in kind of helping save the yeshiva, Zorach Bar Haftig, he was number 455 on the list, and he received his visa from Sugiara on July 30th, 1940.
So the first, the very first visas with these Curacao notations were really my grandmother, my great grandmother, um, and my my uncle, my great uncle. I'd just like to add. I think it's really important that um, without the Curacao entry visa, Sugihara wouldn't have given the exit visa. He asked, "To which country are you going?" So you had to have an entry visa. So what your grandmother did, that was the foundation. Well, that's right. You couldn't, the yeah. real problem that the Jews who were fleeing Poland or fleeing the Nazis in any way were, as everybody now knows, going back to history, not being permitted entry to any country that they wanted to go to. And the key was, in order to get some visa, some transit visa or something that would get you out of the country that Hitler was ultimately going to come to was to find a country that you could use as a destination. And the notion that you could go to Curaçao, nobody asked for a Curaçao visa, but no, the, the fact that you didn't need a visa to go to Curaçao became a Curaçao visa. Right, my understanding is that one of the requirements that the Japanese insisted on for Sugihara was that he had to demonstrate that these refugees weren't all just coming to Japan. And so this enabled him to say, look, they have this statement about Kurosawa, they're not going to stay in Japan, even though he, he had clearly understood this was a very odd, this wasn't a Kurosawa visa, this was a non-visa, but this was sufficient for him to rely on this to say, well, look, they're going on. They're not staying here. I can give them a transit visa through Japan, not a visa to stay in Japan. And that was what he did. And that was really the miracle of his. I say that if it was not for Sugihara, I wouldn't be here today. And, so. and the chorus, apparently there it was some, I don't know whether it's a Polish word, but I recall my father saying that to those who ignored the Curacao possibility, Kurosh, or something like that was considered a, you know, a kind of a silly thing. I mean, oh, what, you're going to go to Curacao or Kurosh something? And um, those who did not take advantage of it made fun of it in a certain sense because it was Curacao. You was going to go to Curacao. And Nathan, I think, could you just tell um your, I don't know if you remember, you were very young, but you went to Moscow oh, right. and you went okay. on yes, the uh, Trans-Siberian Railroad to Vladivostok and then to so What, to what was the trip? Kobe. The trip for me and for my parents was from Vilna to Moscow, from Moscow by Trans-Siberian Railroad to Vladivostok, which in those days was two weeks on the train. Um, and then from Vladivostok by ship to some location in Tsuruga, Japan. Tsuruga, they say. Tsuruga. What? Tsuruga. Tsuruga? Tsuruga. Maybe. I don't remember what then, the location then was, Tsukobi. but then ultimately to come to Kobe in Japan, where there was a Jewish community that welcomed the refugees in, Ko in, in Kobe. They did set up for the refugees from Europe. And so I did make that trip and it's amazing that the Russians, that the Soviet government, honored the Sugihara visa. Because, after all, the Soviets were not allowing people to leave this great paradise of the Soviet Union just whenever they wanted to leave. And yet, if you had a Sugihara visa from Vladivostok, you could leave to go to Japan. So the, the Soviet government honored that. I made that trip at the age of four, and I have to confess that I don't remember a single minute of that two-week trip on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. It could not have been pleasant, but uh, I made it with my parents and my grandmother and my mother's brother. We all traveled that whole route from Vilna to Moscow, from Moscow to Vladivostok, from Vladivostok to Japan. And your recollections in Japan? Pardon? You mentioned that you remember something in Japan? Yes, I do. The first, my first childhood memory <laughs> is being on the steps in the house that we 
lived in, apparently for the short period of time we were there, we rented an apartment that was up on the second floor of some building in Kobe. And I was out in the street, playing in the street, and as a uh, four-year-old uh, Polish boy, I did not know and could not get accustomed to the Japanese rule that if you left the street and came into the house, there were slippers by the door. You had to take off the shoes that you wore in the street and put on the slippers. So my earliest recollection was this traumatic incident in which I am running up the stairs, apparently making some noise with my shoes as I run up the stairs, and a Japanese man opens the door downstairs and yells up at me, how could I do this, you know, that I'm, I'm running up the stairs and not putting on the slippers. That's my earliest childhood memory. Well, I want to thank you so very much for um, for this. We're actually witnessing history, and um, there are no words to describe our appreciation. Well, we thank you thank for you. taking the time to really document this. It's been a great honor and a privilege. Thank you so thank very you much. Very much. I have a feeling.